I'm going to ask our <coughs> panel members to introduce themselves briefly and then you'll have the roving mic uh, to use. Um, Mike, can I have another mi microphone up here and we'll use the two perhaps? Okay, uh, we've got about, uh, as I understand, about 35 to 40 minutes for our time together. We've got some questions here which have come out of the group structures. So let me first of all, all ask Linda if she'll introduce herself and then just down the line, but just briefly because we want to get to the questions. Okay. I'm Linda Gill, um, I'm from Nelson, I'm a mum with three daughters. Um, the youngest one, who is 26, has profound special needs. Um, I'm part of Grace Church in Nelson and um, I've spent the last 20 years um, foisting special needs on that church. And, um, it, <laughs> it has made a huge impact in that, um, in that community, yeah. My name's Tere Moana Va'a. Um, I was, I had a spinal cord injury in 2007 um, with a pre-existing condition called DISH um, and what that is is bone spurs growing between my neck and my vertebra and they're all starting to fuse together. Um, I have four children and three grandchildren um, and I Previously, before my injury, I uh, worked uh, as a social worker for a number of years, and um, and now today I'm working at Elevate, doing the front desk, um, doing administration and reception work there. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Tarofa. Uh, my name is Imo Sitifano. Um, I'm an ordained minister of the Congregational Christian Church of Samoa, studying here at the University of Auckland uh, in my PhD. Uh, I have four children, only one wife, and um, <laughs> very happy and content. But uh, I'm here today because um, of uh, the ladies uh, at Elevate Disability looked me up through Attitude TV. I've done a bit of work with mental illness and stigma and discrimination with them and, and like minds like mine. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 94 uh, in my seventh form year at Hamilton Boys High, and ever since then, uh, ups and downs um, and so forth. So I've just come here just to uh, use that experience to help uh, others and especially the church uh, become aware in, uh, of mental illness. Okay. Emmanuel? Do you know me? I've been Thank you. Did you want any more information? No, I think we know you as far as we are able to. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I'm hoping uh, that when we leave today, all of us will go back to churches with things to do, things to recommend, um, practical ways forward. And so I'm hoping that our panellists can answer the questions in such ways that you'll give us ideas to put into practice. Um, so let me address this first one now. I think the panellists who'd like to answer it just sort of make a motion of some sort or wave or whatever you want to do and the microphone can come to you so just look at each other a little bit and you'll be aware of it. Uh, this first one, what is the best way uh, to find and develop the gifts of people with impairments? What is the best way to find and develop the gifts of people with impairments? Uh, and uh, um, thinking in terms of spiritual gifts, the gift lists in scriptures and the participation of uh, spirit gifted people in the church. So who would like to take that one? What is the best way to find and develop those gifts? Thank you, Linda. I'd have to say, first of all, you just gotta to get to know people. Yeah. It's just, they're just like everybody else. And uh, in our church, we have um, four um, young people with profound special needs. I mean, no, no language. And, and yet they have impacted our whole church. They have, softened hearts, they've changed lives in an amazing way and um, it's just people become blessed if they stop, take time and get to know them and, um, and then you start to see God working in their life and um, you can start to see 
what they've got to offer, actually, and it's usually a lot more than we think. We think we're reaching out, offering something to them, but we're getting something so much richer there. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So it starts with that. Um, anyone else want to add to that one? Um, I think <clears throat> in the church, one of the things that, that I found is um, these certain departments, um, for example, you know, links, um, ushering, door greeters, and, um, and when you're an able-bodied person, and uh, you don't really have that awareness for people with disabilities, it's probably best to find someone in your church that has a disability and ask them um, questions on how you can raise the awareness. Um, I find that in our church, um, if I can help uh, raise the awareness and say when it comes to ushering or door greeters, people with disabilities want to partake but they don't quite know how to. So yeah. it's good to find someone in your church that has a disability. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I would do kind of what's been said, but I do want to say one of the ways that we can stop ourselves seeing the gifts in others is if we have a small list of what gifts look like. The Spirit of God works in a diverse group of ways and we just say we need to be open surprises. Very nice. Thank you. Any more? Did you want to say uh, something? Just, yeah, just to add, um, coming from a, a congregational Christian church, uh, Mormon background, uh, I think uh, that the church um, needs to create an open atmosphere, and, and that atmosphere, I, I really believe, begins in prayer, and as, as part of the, le the leadership of the church, the minister or the leaders who are in charge of not only administration of the church but especially the ministry is just to encourage uh, an atmosphere of prayer where there is waiting on the Lord or waiting for the Spirit's guidance and opening uh, our perspectives and opinions to exactly what Emmanuel um, has, has, has told us, uh, the diversity of the Spirit, not to have uh, pre, uh, pre set ideas about the gifts. Thank you. Tim, if you could take the next question, this is to do with the Church of Healing, so uh, we haven't heard from Tim in this round, but perhaps he can start the next one. Um, Tim, uh, at the McKnight Conference last week, he spoke about um, covenant in terms of being with people, being for people, and being unto people. He used the words presence, advocacy, and embrace. Um, so this question came from our group, I think, uh, and there's a second one on healing. Um, what does healing look like for a church which practices presence, advocacy and embrace? And how can we help deal with churches that have an emphasis on healing? Uh, I think the question perhaps presupposes an unhe unhealthy emphasis on a specific sort of healing. So do you want to address the question of healing a little bit for us? And what that could look like for a church community to practice well? <laughs> Great question, Ross. <laughs> I think um, faith is, uh, uh, is a key word for me. So when I came out of hospital, my neighbours said to me, you have a Christian faith, you'll do well. And so that faith didn't get me leaping out of my chair, but it had effect on our neighbourhood in a way that I hadn't necessarily uh, anticipated. So maybe there's been, been uh, an element of healing in their minds as to how they see faith. You know, how do we see healing? Um, so within the church community, um, practising the presence of God is allowing God to work in people's lives in, in different ways and uh, 
making a uh, or creating an environment where it's uh, where it's okay to be like you are. It's a permission giving environment. <coughs> and if God does this for somebody, let's celebrate that. If God doesn't, then that's okay as well, because clearly our ultimate hope as Christians. The end result, uh, the kingdom result is eternity in heaven. Eternity begins here. So our hope is always beyond what we think God is doing in the here and the now. Um, What was the other three things that you said, Rod, about that? Presence, advocacy, and embrace, being with, being for, being to or towards. Yeah. uh, Three words that sort of Okay, so to journey with someone is to journey with them in such a way that they don't feel hugely disappointed um, when um, people are are praying for them and perhaps nothing happens, you still journey with them. You maintain your support, you're there with them and allow... God to minister to to them in, mm. in that, that whole thing. Mm. Um, it, it is a difficult one, but I'm absolutely confident that God heals. We still need to recognise the power mm. of God. He raised Jesus from the dead, mm. and Paul says God is able to use that same power. Mm. So God does, and he chooses in his grace. Mm. Um, others might like to comment um, but as the microphone perhaps moves if you'd like to say something just let Tim know or let many know as well might. that withness being with someone r- rather than merely being for them um, stops us from becoming patronising so I'm for you but I'm distant can be patronage I'm with you and I'm for you means I'm present and I'm on your side which is what God does for us strikes me that if churches are to be with people in their ongoing struggles and challenges and, and life, that it's got to be a very active church. It needs, to, it needs a whole body membership in motion because the pastor and elders, if they're the only people who are going to be with, uh, are very soon going to run out of resource, right? So we're looking, if we're with, as the first stance, at a very active church. So I wonder how we develop the community of witness as well as fourness as well as on Tunis. Um, so that's just a subsequent question. But does anyone else want to answer this question on healing and what you think it means for you or a community, Manny? Um, a couple of things to that. Uh, I think thinking about the way we interpret disability poses an interesting lens. If we interpret disability through a medical model within the church, we're going to see healing as God curing the impairment. If we interpret it more socially as a person being disabled by the barriers that people put in place for them, then maybe we need to rethink what healing means. Maybe it means that the whole church needs God to work in them so that the whole church can together pull down some of these barriers so they can be included more. And maybe that is the way the spirit is working. You're talking about community wellness and perhaps different ways of understanding healing, disability and wholeness. Um, I I was um, had my um, injury in 2007 and, um, and I had a situation where um, I would go into church and you know I had the whole church praying for me, I had um, my pastors praying for me and everyone was claiming healing and I was believing in faith and I would pray for my own healing. Um, 
But I recently, this year, came across one, one person who, for the first time, came up to me and said to me, you know, I'm going to stand with you for your healing. And um, in all the years I've had my injury, I've never really had that one person say that to me. I've had everyone say they're going to, you know, that they're going to pray for my healing, but I've never really had someone say, I'm going to stand with you in your healing. So I think communication and, you know, how you communicate to people is really important too. Great, thank you. Uh, let me start this question then with, with Linda, you've got the microphone. Um, <laughs> um, it's a practical question, I think a helpful one. Um, is it best or easiest to have one person in charge of and organising as a contact point in the church for this sort of ministry or is it better to organise in a different way? So structurally, what's the best way to start this happening? One contact person or what? Well, I guess I, I'll just tell you what, if you want to tell you what happened in our churches. There were three families. We all had profound special needs children. We got to about 10 or 11, 12, and actually there was no place for us at church. Um, so you start to toss up who's going to go with them today. Once you physically can't keep her in a seat, um, then we had troubles. So I was getting very much like, well, why don't they? Why don't they? Why doesn't somebody help? Why? 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 And it was like God says, well, why don't you? So I feel like yeah, somebody has to spearhead. Um, there's always, you know, traction always seems to need a driver. So I started to spearhead perhaps we should do something for our children, which we did. We um, took them out of the service once they started to get disruptive and we started a little program called Heaven Sent. And what, what it happened for there is I had 21 people eventually that started to come out with me on a rotating system. So we had 21 people that we were slowly training up to be comfy and relaxed and start to get to know our kids. And that, that catalyst started off a whole lot of change. So um, I've found for out with our church, people really wanted to be involved, but they were terrified to know how, so they stay back. But when you show them a pathway in and help them into it, um, it just kind of spread. Yeah, so I think you, somebody has to drive. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, the, the microphone's coming to you, Imola. <laughs> and I've got the next question to start with you. So, do you want to answer this one? Or? Uh, no, okay. Well, this one, this one is about Asian culture, but it's a, it's a question that I think different ones will reflect on, and perhaps Imola, you can start. How do we support parents, particularly from a culture such as Asian cultures, where there is shame being felt? How can the church help break through and not enforce this culture or cycle of shame felt around uh, disability. Now, um, perhaps we can broaden it out, and Tim, you might like to speak about this as well as a pastor, that a theology of weakness for the church, which is a very key theology in Paul's writings, uh, and books which have come out about God as a disabled God, would say that perhaps we've got a misunderstanding anyway of what leadership looks like and what strength looks like, uh, and what shame should be attached to. So with all of that in mind, can we start with them all? How do you support parents, groups, cultural groups, particularly that can feel shame? How can we break through and not enforce a cycle of shame around disability? Excellent question. Um, from, a, from a Samoan perspective, um, I can identify with uh, uh, that particular question uh, and, and the element of shame is still very much real in, in the society that I live in and have been brought up in. Um, as, as, as a minister, as a pastor, as a leader in the church, I think uh, to support these parents, we need to actually be able to go to them, uh, to, to, to talk through uh, uh, the element of shame in a sense of even uh, showing that, as, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the theology that the church actually might be promoting actually might not actually be uh, a fair reflection of, of what, what is actually intended uh, through the gospel. And, and, and th that's a challenge that I'm seeing in, in my church is that for many years, um, even a century, uh, 
the ministers who have had control of the interpretation of the gospel uh, have, in a sense, uh, propped up or, or haven't actually challenged um, the honour and shame elements of, of our society, or Samoan society. So, uh, as, as a minister or as a leader of the church, um, addressing that theological um, interpretation is one thing, but also um, making that family or, or, or addressing the support, supporting those parents uh, and, and seeing, and seeing a, a new light or a new appreciation of, of, of the scriptures and gospel. But um, I think as uh, um, one of our groups uh, mentioned is that, you know, who will make the first step or, you know, um, is that just the Moore's opinion or can that, can that how can that um, filter through other um, congregational Samoan ministers, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Tim, do you, do you want to reflect as well? Um, I guess pastorally we need to be consistent uh, across the cultures. I think that's important, and yes, having a greater understanding. Um, for us, yeah, we have Māori people, uh, Filipino, Sri Lankan, far more multicultural than what I expected. I was really enjoyed it when we came to Rotorua. Um, just let's come back to an example where a, a mother came into church with three children, and one of the children ran up on stage and banged the drums and then <laughs> took off out. And so for me as a pastor, I was able to just say to the church during the service at an appropriate time, hey, listen, this is what's just happened. Um, this child is a runner and happened to be on the autistic spectrum, I think, from memory. And so I was able to just educate, give a little bit of explanation. It's okay. Um, this is what happens. And so, you know, guards come down, people's prejudices, uh, depending on whatever culture, really. So I guess it, to educate people, I really like to take those opportunities as a leader and a pastor where it's necessary. And people generally welcome that. And it, it dissipates any shame that the parents feel, because they do. They they feel shockingly bad. And let's have them leave our churches to go home with a sense of feeling, you know, not embarrassed but upheld. Yeah. Others who'd like to respond. I I just feel it's like I had to get to a point where I stopped asking God to heal my daughter and part of that was like get us out of this mess but it, God showed me very very clearly that he created her exactly as she is um, just as much as he created me exactly who I am and when I stopped asking God to fix her and started thanking God for the tremendous gift of who she is then everything changed about my attitudes and sometimes I think asking for healing can be um, unhelpful. And, and add to that shame, I've, as a New Zealander, I've never felt any shame in having a daughter, except from a few people at church who would sort of ask you, um, have I got enough faith? And that's where you start to feel the shame, but it was a bad shame, it shouldn't have been. Yeah, I think we have, to under, we have to understand that God actually doesn't make mistakes. And um, he creates people for really good reasons, even though it doesn't run along with our theory. <laughs> um, Manny, here's one that responds to your session. How do we cultivate a culture of inclusion that is accountable as well? How do we cultivate a, a culture of inclusion or belonging uh, that is accountable? So you talked about ethically accountable, I think. How do you cultivate a culture like that in churches? Can you pass it? Yeah. Um, for me, um, you, you, the big thing about accountability is leading people to Christ. 
that people can come with their brokenness and know as they are honest with their problems, with their sins, they will be led to grace, to a way to, that will work through those things. So, in terms of um, what does that mean then for being able to say this is sin and a problem and this is not, I think it frees us not from saying those things but it frees us to say those things well. Because we know that we will have a path to move the people along. And it's not about judgment. It's not about I'm better than you. But it's about saying together how can we experience what Christ has done and is doing in and through us. Others? Mary? Uh, I think that um, pastors and ministers of the churches, they have an amazing gift and, uh, and I think that they um, they've got, uh, I don't know if you would say they've got the, the power to actually move a congregation and, um, and I think when they are preaching in their messages that they bring um, something in their messages that's, that's going to change the congregation because um, people in the churches they look at the pastors and they look at ministers and, and they hear them preaching and they take their word and then they go and uh, they apply it to their lives so what you're actually preaching in your church will actually um, help to to move a con congregation as well thank you anyone else Um, this one came up in our group, and uh, perhaps I get all of you to answer. Maybe it's a one or two sentence answer. Um, what is the purpose of the church? Is it to meet the needs of the people or something else? And how will that be described? And this came out of a discussion with you know churches being asked to do more and more and more and more, and pastors are being asked to do more and more and more. And um, we can we could become social work agencies. We could become schools. We could become alternative families um, but there is a point when church leaders get killed by demand and so it emanated in the, in the question so actually what is the purpose of the church and while you're all thinking of your answers so <laughs> we'll start with Tim and come down then you get to go last um, Scott McKnight said provocatively last week the purpose the mission of the church is to be the church and that begs the question, let's really talk that through, because he wanted to say that the church is this alternative community, this alternative way of being human in relationship with Jesus as king and one another as new creation. That the purpose of the church is stop trying to, uh, he might not have said, you know, be relevant and pursue um, favour, but be the church and let people see what Jesus is like. So his whole thing was a contrast community that shows itself to be radically other by the presence of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So the mission of the church is to be the church. And he had evangelism as a very key part of being the church. But if you had to answer the question in one sentence or two, which you have to do now, um, Tim, what is the purpose of the church? Okay, well, biblically... Um we're called to go and make disciples and to do that obviously in such a way that we're empowered by the Spirit to witness. So there's, there's your, <laughs> your core answer. <clears throat> and if mission is at the forefront 
of our thinking, um, how, how do we go about that? Um, we do it in, uh, with love, and I think that the body of Christ needs to reflect a loving and a compassionate environment, and one that will allow people to serve in the way that God has gifted them. And, you know, you mentioned before about the gifts of the Spirit, and um, there's, there's more good things out there than I think we know about, potentially. So let's create an environment for the body um, to be itself. And so each church needs to have a different flavour and let's allow that to happen instead of compete with each other. So the body, I think the church is also about complementing other bodies and saying it's okay for us to have this flavour because the other church down the road can have that flavour and do it better than us. Cool, thank you. Matty? Two sentences. <laughs> um, I think the church is the place where God's presence dwells and is active most for the people within it and for the transformation of the world around it. Thank you, man. That was one long sentence. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, what we as a church are, are supposed to do or uh, have been created to be is basically to um, live up to uh, Jesus' golden rule or love God and love, love our neighbour. Uh, with all our heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and strength, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, the church, it's an interesting question, because the church for me is a place where I can go to and I can um, fellowship and be with people and connect. And um, it doesn't mean like if I leave the church, I'm not going to know God. You know, when I leave, I'm still going to go out and I'm still going to have the church in me, but it's a place where we can come together and fellowship and, um, and you know, be with people. Thank you. Um, I think it's the church is the hope of the world. I the think, hope of the world. I think we're called to be light in dark places. Okay. And um, I would, you know, I would pinch the scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbour yeah. as yourself. Kind of. I remember Eugene Peterson writing against triumphalism and over-promising stuff some years ago now in an article in Leadership Magazine said uh, the church needs to stop promising things and teach people to worship God. And that was his single statement on purpose. It's a community which declares the worthiness of God and worships God, so love and worship for God. Um, we may have one minute left, Mike. I think we've got one minute, so this is a, a very quick question. If we order mess too much, do we stifle the Holy Spirit? And so how do we order without stifling many? Um, I, take, take the mic. Take the mic. Okay. I think we can. We run that risk. But um, I also think we can um, um, work, it works the other way as well. Um, if you've seen the Compass Dance Trip, uh, which is, um, we had the pleasure of seeing a couple of weeks ago, very well choreographed, very well designed, in order that people in the diversity may participate. And I think that's a metaphor for what I'm trying to say. 
design in order to include, not design to exclude. Mm. If we're ordered around the gospel rather than a consumer package, yeah. it's a different sort of order, isn't it? Yeah. It's an order of freedom. Yeah. Let's uh, thank our panellists. Thank you very much. <laughs>